Okay, good, good. Our study this lesson, or this quarterly, is uh, uh, the kingdom of God. Um, we, I might use that terminology, the kingdom of God. I might use the kingdom of heaven. And I might even use the church in explaining, uh, but pretty much all three of those terminologies is about the same thing. And so I, uh, so don't get confused if I say one or the other there. Let's, I want to kind of give an introduction to the Cordley here a little bit that was written here. We are reminded of a song that, uh, that, uh, is called there's just something about that name and i'm sure a lot of us has heard that song you know and and we uh we like i like that song but anyway uh in the song it notes that earthly kings and kingdoms will all pass away and uh you know has there been previous kingdoms Brother Buzz saying, yeah, there he has been. Well, do you remember the kingdom of Babylon that took the children of Israel captive, you know? Okay, and then, you know, that kingdom was a strong kingdom for a long time. But, you know, there was another kingdom that came up that conquered that kingdom. And I think it was the Medes and the Persians, wasn't it, that conquered that kingdom and they were stout for a while and then pretty soon the Greek kingdom came along and conquered that kingdom and so you know that's the way it went and then finally the Roman kingdom came along and and you know it just seems like that's that's the way it happens the earthly kingdoms they they rise up they're strong for a time and maybe for a long time but then it seems like another kingdom comes up and conquers the other one. But, you know, we're going to find out a little bit of difference about the kingdom of God. It's, it's a little different. It's a lot different than, than these earthly kingdoms. Kingdoms may come and they may pass away, but there's something about that name. Yes, there certainly is something about the name of Jesus and his kingdom. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 explains it, and here's what it says. Wherefore, God also have highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in earth and things in earth. I missed that first, first one. Of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When we speak of the kingdom of God, we may rightly say this is just, there is just something about that kingdom. Brother uh, Weindorf wrote this here, and I'm, I'm reading it to you because I thought it was real good. I, wa I wanted to, to relay this to you. We do know that if we are a part of the kingdom of God, we have something that the world can't give and the world can't take away. Only the blood of Jesus gives. And he says only sin takes away. That's only if we allow that sin to take it away from us. Sin cannot come in and conquer you unless you let it conquer you. And so, uh, so uh, I, I, I kind of wanted to, to, to read that to you. I got another thing here, and uh, uh, do you know what a kingdom is? It is a government over which a king rules. There is the kingdom of Great Britain, the kingdom of Belgium, and others. I looked some more kingdoms up. I thought, well, you know, how many kingdoms is there in the in the world? There's a bunch of them, and I wrote down some some more just to kind of expound on. Cambodia is also a kingdom. Jordan's a kingdom. Denmark, Thai, Thai, Thailand, Sweden, Netherlands, Norway, Saudi Arabia, Spain. 
That's some of the kingdoms. Now, I, I was looking in an older book that was probably five, five years old. Now, some of these might have changed since that time. I'm not sure. But at that time, this was some of them. And then that wasn't even all of them. But I, I didn't realize there was that many kingdoms in the world. I think there's a hundred and, what was there? Hmm, uh, was there 190 some countries, I believe, in the world at that time or something like that? I think I'm, I think I'm quoting the right thing. I wish I'd wrote it down. But this is some of the kingdoms that are, that are considered kingdoms. Well, there's also other uh, forms of government, which like the United States, we're under a republic. We are, we are a republic rather than a kingdom. There's other countries that are, are a democracy. There's other countries that's, that's, that's communist and, and so on. But we are taught, we're, what our study is, uh, this, this quarterly is, is on the kingdom. So I wanna, I wanna kinda uh, keep my mind focused on that. God has a kingdom too. It is called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. In some ways, it is like earthly kingdoms. In some ways, it is very different from them. Is the kingdom of God the same as the church of God? Yes, in a way it is. However, the words church and kingdom are used to express a little different applications of thought. The church is the people of God. The kingdom is the rule of God in those people's hearts. Now there is a little bit of separation, but as a whole, when you talk about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, or the church of God, or the church that Jesus built, either one, it's pretty much the same thing, but there is just a little bit of difference. Therefore, when a person is saved, he enters the church, and he enters the kingdom too at the same time. In other words, when a person is saved, enters the church, he allows God to rule in his heart, thereby entering the kingdom. He becomes subject to his Savior, Jesus, the King of Kings. And I, as we study the kingdom of God this quarterly, we will learn many interesting and wonderful things about it. If you are not saved now, we hope you will be before the quarter ends then you will be a citizen in the kingdom of God. It was kind of a, kind of a uh, thing that I wanted to read to you that was in the junior accordly. And it's encouraging us to be part of that kingdom of God. Why? Because this kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Uh, isn't, there, isn't there a verse in there? Isn't there a song that we have? Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Thy dominion goes on forever and ever, you know? And so, so if, you, if we want to be a part of, of the right thing, we got to be a part of the kingdom of God. And that's the greatest thing that can happen to us as human beings is to be part of the kingdom of God. Our first lesson is Christ's parable of the vineyard. Our memory verse for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. What does the word conclude mean? Concluded? What does that word mean? Come to the conclusion. Come to the conclusion. And usually that conclusion is sometimes not so good, is it? It can be cut off. We can be cut off, could be part of it. And uh, so, so uh, to bring to an end in a particular way or a particular action or to cut off, form a final judgment or to reach a decision. And you know, the, we'll, let's, uh, uh, we're gonna run into this verse later on in our lesson. And so I'm gonna just kind of leave that with that. The emphasis, the junior emphasis, God first chose the children of Israel to be his kingdom. And, you know, he, he encouraged the children of Israel to be his people and he would be their God. You be my subjects and I will be your king. In other words, is what he was telling them. And, uh, and so he chose them. 
way back, uh, I would say the first, uh, uh, first choosing was when he chose Abraham. And, uh, and he, he saw, he saw a, a, a just man there that, hey, Abraham, I've got good things for you if you'll just follow me. And I will make nations out of you, and and uh, that's that's that that was kind of the uh, the the beginning of of what we're talking about here. They did not give God love and obedience. God took the kingdom from Israel and gave it to the church. The church is spiritual Israel. The church loves and obeys God. As long as we love and obey God, we are part of the kingdom of God. When we, as individuals, become bitter against God or start disobeying God, we become, we, we lose our um, um, citizenship in the kingdom of God, and we become a citizen of another kingdom, which is the kingdom of Satan. And so there is two kingdoms. There is two kingdoms in the spiritual world, which is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. But we know that the kingdom of God has dominion over the kingdom of Satan. And we know that if we're, we're with God, obeying God, doing His will, love Him, obey Him, and do what He says, we're part of the kingdom of God, Dan. Let's go ahead and get into our reading here, Matthew 21, 33. And it's Jesus talking here, and He says, Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and dig the wine press in it, and build a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. Husbandmen. That was, that's the first thing I want to want to conquer here first. What is a husbandman? Someone who takes care of the vineyard. In order, other words, it's the farmer. It's the it's the one that a caretaker. It's the one that takes care of what is left for them to take care of. And in this case, it's a vineyard here. God planted, or it says this householder planted a vineyard. Okay, he didn't just plant a vineyard and say, okay, there it is, right there. No, he, he, he prepared it. He hedged it round about. Well, why, why would he want to do that? For protection. Hedged it. He even put a hedge around it. He digged the wine press. Why did he do that? Because he was expecting fruit off of this wine press, you know. He's getting it all set up. He's expecting fruit. He's expecting something out of this. He didn't just build it just, uh, just because he didn't have nothing to do that day, but he built it because he's expecting something out of that. What else did he do? And he built a tower. He built a tower. Why would you build a tower? so that people can watch, so that there can be a watch set out in case something starts coming. You know, whether it be uh, uh, another person or an animal or whatever. Hey, I need to see over these vines. You know, I'm expecting vines to grow and sometimes they get higher than what I can see over. And so we need to have a tower here. And God knew that. He built a tower so that we could see see what what's going on he wanted that to be a protected place he didn't want it just to be grow grow and just anybody help theirself to it but you know it was his he he put forth the effort there and he let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country the householder cares for his vineyard God, Jesus told this story, being a parable, it was a meaning more than just the action of the story. Watch for the meanings. Jesus told of a householder, the owner of the vineyard, he planted it himself. And you know, if he would have let somebody else plant it, it wouldn't have been built the way he wanted it, would it? 
And you know, that's the way Jesus is. He came and he set up what was, uh, what, what he, the way he wanted it to be built. He hedged or fenced it to keep out harmful animals or people. He digged a wine press for pressing the juice from the grapes. He built a tower that one could climb to watch for danger. I want to back up there. He built a wine press. He was expecting fruit from this. Why else would he want this, this vineyard if it wasn't for the fruit, you know? You know, why, just to look pretty? No, huh? -uh. there's things that needs to be accomplished. Something like that, God brought Israel as a vine out of Egypt and planted it in Canaan. That is found in Psalms 80, verse 8. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou preparest room before it, and d didst cause it to take deep root, and is, it filled the land. That was written in Psalms there. Remember how the Israelites came out of Egypt through the Red Sea with Moses as their leader? I think we just studied that about, what, three months ago? Or the last three months, maybe I should say. God protected them from all their enemies. And he did. Well, who was their first enemy? I, 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 would, I would say that the first enemy that they met was Pharaoh himself. Because they come, he come after them. And, you know, it looked like they were in the, in the middle of, of disaster. But God took, God made a way for them and took care of them. And by leading them through the Red Sea and use that very Red Sea to destroy them, them that, was, that was pursuing. God protected them from all their enemies. He gave them a home in Cana. He cared for them. God told Israel, if ye will obey my word, ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's found in Exodus 19 and 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my commandment, commandment, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. That's God talking to Israel. Uh, Moses and he's telling them that and I think I, I can remember when we were studying this a peculiar people you know I think I even brought out you know peculiar when we when we talk about peculiar we think of odd you know and all but that's not quite what that word means it means a a separate people is is what is what he was talking about there I think I even brought that up at the time but you know we're not an odd people we're a people chosen of God that wants us and wants our uh, resources of labors for His kingdom is what He what is 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 what He wants from us. He chose the nation of Israel be His kingdom. He gave them His law. He talked to them. In the parable, the owner went away and left the vineyard in vineyard in care of the husbandman. God put his kingdom of Israel in care of leaders. He wanted fruit from them as an owner wants fruit from a vineyard. The fruit he wanted, what was the fruit he wanted? It was love and obedience. The question is now, did he get it? Okay, let's, let's think about that. Did he get it? Matthew 21 and 34. We'll pick up there then our second reading. And when the time of the fruit grew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruit of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat them and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son. You would think, oh, okay. 
Now he's sending his son. Now they better watch out, you know. Saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said unto themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. All the others, you know, they beat and whipped and, 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 and even killed some of them. But then when his son comes, they'll have reverence for him. But they didn't. They did, sadly to say, they didn't. The wicked husbandman commits sin in the parable when the owner sent servants to get the fruit the husbandmen beat, killed, and stoned them. And, you know, all they were coming was for the fruit. Why was the, why was the vineyard even built? It was for that fruit. They, he was coming back to get that fruit, you know. Now, what had happened? Did the workers, the husbandmen, did they slough, slough off and were lazy? And there was no fruit. That could have been a possibility there. Was there no fruit? Was there fruit, but they wanted to keep it for themselves? That's a possibility. What, what was going on here? For some reason, they did not want to give up that fruit, if there was fruit there. The husband would beat, killed, and stoned them. When he finally sent his son, they caught him, cast him out, and slew him. How did the Israelites do with God's servants who tried to get them to love and obey God? You remember some that warned them about the things to come? My mind goes back to Isaiah. My mind goes back to Jeremiah, Ezekiel, different ones. Even some of the ones that are less known Nahum, you know, what do we know about Nahum? We don't know a whole lot about him, but he was a prophet. He was one of these that, 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 that the parable is referenced to. Obadiah, uh, different ones, Malachi, Zechariah. You know, there was, there was several of them there that he was referenced there to. How did the Israelites do with God's servants who tried to get them to love and obey God? How many times did Jeremiah tell them to turn? Turn from your wicked ways, you know. You know, there was one time when he said, um, um, whatever you do, I, I, believe this is, I believe this is right. Whatever you do, don't go to Egypt. I think, I think, I think he told the children of Israel, whatever you do, don't go to Egypt. And they had him in a pit and everything. And what did they do? That was the first thing they did. They grabbed up Jeremiah and away off, off they go to Egypt then. He just told them. That's what God had relayed to him. Don't go to Egypt, you know. But they was always so ready to, to do it their own way. They always wanted to do it their own way. Oh, well, we kind of see an out this way. What God tells us, I don't see an out this way, but I can kind of see an out that way. It's only an illusion. It's only a trap. It's only a mess. When God tells you to go one way and you look the other way and you see a little out, that's like being out on the desert and seeing a mirage and you're, and you're just as thirsty as you can be and you get to the, where you think the water is and what is it? Just old dry sand. That's, that's, that's what the devil is wanting, wanting to do to us, is trick us and give us a mirage rather than give us what God has for each and every one of us. And that's the first thing they wanted to do, go to, go to Egypt. That's, an, that's just one example. They killed some of, the, uh, some of God's prophets. They misused them. They would not listen to God's prophets. How many, how many people or how many prophets did God send to the Israelites 
that the Israelites actually uh, he, uh, adhered to, uh, 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 abided to, or, or listened to. Not very many, was they? I don't know if I can name one, but you know, they was always ready to go against what God had told the prophet, and the prophet was relaying to them, oh no, we don't see it that way. We don't see it that way, is a lot of times what they said. They would not listen. They would not love and obey. God called them his vineyard and said they brought forth wild grapes. Finally, God sent his son. And who was that son that, 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 that was mentioned in our reading there? It was none other but Jesus. That's who he was talking about. Okay, did the people of Israel listen to and obey him then? They ought to have, but no. Not many did. What'd they do? They hung him on the cross. They killed him by hanging him on the cross. You know. Let's look at that uh, Matthew 21 and 40. When the Lord thereof of the kingdom... Uh, I'm, I'm really messing up here. When the Lord thereof of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? Now this is Jesus telling a parable to, I think it was the scribes and the Pharisees and might have been, been Sadducees, but it was, the, it was the religious group here. The religious group is who he's referring, is who he's talking to here. And he's asking, what should be done to this husbandman? They said unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruit in their seasons. Boy, they had an answer for her. They had an answer for, for Jesus, didn't they? Do you remember Nathan the prophet coming to David after David committed sin with Bathsheba? I think he brought out a little parable, you might say, that this man had a little lamb. And... That's the only lamb he had. Another man had flocks of sheep, and he also had a neighbor, had a friend that came. Well, he didn't want to take from his flock of sheep, so he went and got this one that just had one little lamb, and took that sheep, killed it, and fed it to his to his neighbor. What did David say? That man needs to be killed. But that, that, that guy is wrong for doing something like that. And I seem to agree with that, you know. That would be wrong to do that, you know. What did Nathan, what did Nathan say? I think it was Nathan. I, I think I'm right. What did Nathan tell, tell David then? Thou art the man. Sister Bailey says, thou art the man. You know, David was blinded to what had really happened. I mean, the devil had him blinded to that. Well, let's, let's look here. The Pharisee suggested punishment. Jesus asked the Pharisee what the owner would do to the husbandman. The Pharisees were leaders in Israel, the spiritual leaders, or religious leaders, the very ones Jesus was talking about. However, they did not realize that yet. They said the wicked husband should be destroyed and the vineyard led out to others who would do right and who would love and do the right thing and, and be what they should be, you know. You know... We need to ask God each and every day, help us to keep our eyes open to the things that you have for me each and every day. Help me so that the devil does not blind me to the things that I, the, to the pitfalls and the different things that 
I would be capable of falling into if I went on my own power, you know. We understand and we're the first ones to say that we cannot live a Christian life in our own power. I think, I think every one of us would agree with that. I cannot live a Christian life in my own power. I have to have the power of God to live. There's, there's no way. I tried it once. Way back years ago, I tried it, you know, and it didn't work. I would get so discouraged with myself, you know, that, that you know, you try to do good. And like Paul said, you try to do good, but you couldn't. You know, the things that you knew was right, uh, you would fail, you know. And, and, you know, we have to each and every day get our leading and guidance from, from God each and every day because, like I said, we can't do it on our own. We can't do it on our own. If we try to do it on our own, we're, we're going to hit that pitfall. We're going to hit that chug hole. And we're going to hit this dead center and it's going to trip us up and we're going to get discouraged and, and before you know it, you're going to backslide. But you know, when we have God leading us and us following, loving and obeying and following what Christ has for us, he'll lead us around them chug holes that, that could discourage us. Yeah, he's, we're going to be, we're going to meet discouragements. We're going to meet trials. We're going to meet temptations, but he can lead us around. And if we put our trust in him and let him lead us, you know, we followed God. We followed G Jesus uh, uh, a certain amount of time in our life, you know, and things seems to be going real good. And you know, that's something that we can look back when we, when we do run into a discouragement or something. Well, you know, God led so well back here. And now I'm going through a little low spot maybe. But you know, God's still with me. This is to help me grow. That's what we need to look at it as. Hang on to Jesus. Keep following him. Do what he requires of us to do because it will soon pass. It may seem like forever, but it, it will soon pass and time will go again. Then you could look back to that trial and you think, well, you know, God led me through that. That was kind of a dark part of my uh, life, a dark period in my life. God led me through that. And, you know, we... we Things might be going good. But then, you know, when, when we hit another little trial, we can look back to that trial and grow from it. We can say, okay, God, God protect me. He said he'd protect me. He did. At the time, it looked kind of kind of dull, but, you know, he protected me. And, 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 and that's what we need to do each and every day. Let's read verse 42 there. Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read in the scripture, The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. He's still talking to the Pharisees and the religious leaders here is what he's talking to and he's saying it's going to it's shall be taken from you Ooh, man that's that was kind of a bitter uh, kind of a bitter pill to swallow don't you think first Jesus quoted from the Old Testament about a stone that was rejected or thrown out by builders you know a builder likes to start at a starting point that is pretty sure, real sure. You know, before they even lay a stone, they have to set a benchmark, you know, something they can go off of so that it will stay, it'll be the same because I want the, I want the building to be this high, okay? 
Okay, you, you get the building up close to that high. Well, let's see how, let's see how it compares with the benchmark that's over here, you know, with, with, with what, what we're doing. You know, because you, you, you working around an area, you can change the elevations and different things of an area, but you have to be on something over here that's, that's real firm. And you know Jesus is our benchmark. That's 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 what I'm that's what I'm kind of getting off of. We got to always measure up to that. And you know, and 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 him being the benchmark, he is also the chief cornerstone. And when we start with what he has and build from there. What was next, more or less? It was the prophets, was it? I mean, it was the uh, 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 apostles, you know. And what they, what they had, they had been part of Jesus' ministry for three and a half years. And, you know, they knew what, what Jesus taught. And then they, they, it was built with that then. And then as, as, as we come along and, and, and we can be part of that, that building or that kingdom is, is what I'm talking about there. But you know, the Pharisees didn't want to have nothing to do with it. They, they rejected that stone. They throwed it out. However, that stone was brought back and made the head of the corner the main piece of the building, this stone stood for Jesus. Jesus was crucified but rose again and now is the head of the church. They wanted to get rid of that stone. They were so stuck into their traditions and their, what had happened in the past, you know, that you know, this is all new stuff here and newfangled stuff. And he don't know what he's talking about. It's kind of what the Pharisees looked at Jesus as. He's a kind of a thorn in our flesh. He's kind of messing up our little religious party. <laughs> More or less is what, is what he was talking about. He's a messing that all up, you know. We need to get rid of him. And what they do? They crucified him. Then Jesus said, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, from Israel as a nation, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruit thereof. Now that's what the, that's what the uh, Pharisees told Jesus in that parable. Take it away from them. Give it to somebody that don't really care. You know. Okay. Jesus says, okay, we'll do that then. That's, that's, that's the way it is. He didn't get the idea. Jesus didn't get the idea from them. The idea was already made. It wasn't that the Pharisees had something to do with the kingdom of God there, you know, in their ignorance even. But, but no, God had already planned that. And they just, they was agreeing with him for a change. Finally, for a change, they was agreeing with him, you know, until they found out what the real meaning was. Bring forth the fruit there. Uh, what nation is that? Okay, let me reread that. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, from Israel as a nation, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Uh, what nation is that? Some people might say, well, it's the United States. It was the United States, you know. Wrong. It's the church. It's the church that Jesus built. That's the nation. That's the one. Whatever, whatever people will believe on Jesus and be saved, it is the church. Whatever people will believe on Jesus and be saved, the Bible calls the church a holy nation, a peculiar people, I think it says. And I think that's in 1 Peter, I believe it is. It's not, I not, don't have it before me, but I think that was in Peter where it says that. The church will bring forth fruit to God. That is, they will love and obey Him. That's what God wants. 
is a lovable, obedient people. Are we lovable? Are we obedient? If we're obedient, we'll be a, a lovable people. We will be a lovable people. If any, because God loved us before. Before we were lovable and before we were obedient. But now it's been brought to us, the plan of salvation. And now we can experience that and we can be lovable and obedient back to God. But we could, well, there was no way we could be lovable and obedient to God before we were saved. That's right. God had to love us first. God had to do something for us in order to be able to be in that, that, that uh, uh, condition. We love and obey Him. If any do not, they cannot be part of the church or part of His kingdom. You got to be. Jesus said to His father, father, followers, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. To be part of that kingdom. You know, we can be subjects in the kingdom of God and we can be subject to the law of God. We will never be a king in that kingdom. Oh, well, I guess kings and priests, but, but you know, we're, we're not the ruler. We're not the ruler of the kingdom of God. We are subjects and we are subject to the law that God has for us. And you know, we can be um, uh, so blessed and so happy to be part of the kingdom of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the kingdom of God. I think that's a song. I'm so glad I'm part of the kingdom of God. Not uh, uh, boastful of anything that I did. Uh -uh. I mean, I was lost and undone just like any other sinner out there and but it was through the grace of God that I'm part of that kingdom of God I think the Pharisees there kind of got an ear full I think they kind of and they they were part of what had happened here I mean they 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 made the decision they real go ahead they put that's very well put. They put judgment on their on themselves. They sure did. Yeah, they said, well, yeah, lend it out to the other, and you know that, that sounds like the right right answer, you know. But they and it was the right answer, but it was kicking themselves is what it was. Now, if they would only use that as okay. I'm awake to the fact of what's going on. My eyes has been opened. I realize what, what is going on here now. If they could have fell down and worshiped God and says, okay, yeah, I've, I've been wrong. I want to be part of that kingdom. They could have. God would have been more, and more than happy to accept them yeah. into, into that. Let's go into the memory verse there. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, and he, that he might have mercy upon all. That verse right there has never meant so much to me as it did this morning. I read that verse and I thought, you know, that verse is talking about me. It's talking about you. The plan of salvation is open to all of us. You know, if it was like back b before Christ set up His church, it wouldn't have been. It wouldn't have been for us, because not. I don't think not one of us is a Jew. It was only for the Jews, not a one of us. Matter of fact, they even built the tabernacle in uh, um, uh, 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 the the uh, matter of Jews. Only Jews could come in. And I think the Gentiles had a court out there, but that's as far as they could go. They couldn't go in and enjoy the things that the Jews enjoyed, see? And so, you know, when this happened here, that's when, that's when Jesus opened it all up for everybody. And that included me. 
I did not know it at the time because I wasn't even I wasn't even on this earth at the time that this happened. But you know, you look back and you think, God opened up the way for all of us to be part of his kingdom of God. Not just the children of Israel anymore. Not just the nation of Israel. Not just a certain group of people, but it's open for everyone. God's mercy upon all. Does the parable mean that God will not save Jews? Or that Jews cannot be in the kingdom? Or that Gentiles are better than Jews? Brother Bayless already answered that. He's over there saying no. And that is the correct answer. No. God, it, the only thing it did, it opened up the way that anybody can be accepted into the kingdom of God. Whereas before it was only the Jews. The Jews rejected him. But yet they can still be part of the kingdom of God. They have to come the same way that us Gentiles have to come. We have to come the same way. There's not two ways. There's not a Jewish way and there's not a Gentile way. There's only one way. And everybody, whether you're Jew, Gentile, whether you live in the uh, Amazon jungle or, or live in Alaska, it doesn't make any difference. The God, God is the God of the world. And the people that are contained in the world Yes, we may all, we, every one of us kind of look different, you know. You know, some of us are big and some are small and some are, are, are not so purty like me and other people are a lot more purtier. And, and, and you know, we have different colored skin. We, to, we, to, we talk different. We, we, we might sound different, but we all have to come the same way. Amen. We all have to come the same way. The answer of them questions was no. God first counts all people as unbelievers and as lost sinners. This is both Jews and Gentiles as I was saying. Me, you, everybody was included in that. He wants to have mercy on all. God, but God commended his love towards us that in that while we were yet sinners, I can, I can almost imagine that you all can finish that verse for me. Christ died for us. In that while we were yet sinners, that verse is found in Romans 5 and 8. In that while we were yet sinners. Yeah, but I wasn't even born. Well, when I was born, I was going to be a sinner. That's what he's talking about here. What does it say in uh, uh, Romans uh, uh, 3.23, I think I think it's the verse, for all have sinned and come short. Yes, I come well short of the glory of God. And, uh, but, uh, but God made a way for us. He wants to save us by His power and love and not by our poor little goodness, which is not good at all in us. Well, he's a pretty good feller, you know. Well, if he's not saved, he's no good at all. I hate, to, I hate to burst your bubble, but, you know, when I was a sinner, I wasn't good at all. Oh, I might, I might somebody might have said, oh, you know, he's a pretty good little old boy, you know. He, he, uh, he, uh, he does most of the things that he's supposed to do, but, you know, I wasn't good. There wasn't no good in me. There, there was, I had to come the same way, whether I was young or whether, whether old or young. We all have to come the same way. He goes on and says, which no good in all of us. We all have to be, we all have to repent and be saved. And then we will be in the kingdom of God. One way to enter the kingdom of God and that's to repent and be saved. That's how you get citizenship in this kingdom. Repent and be saved. And repent is not just, I'm sorry for my sin and go on, but tell God that I 
am sorry for my sins, to never do them again, to never sin again. Mean it. Repent. You know, you're going down the road and you're going the wrong way. Repent, turn around and go the other way. And, and do, don't do those things anymore. And that's, that's what he's talking about there. Let Jesus be our king. Citizenship in the kingdom of God can be acquired by anybody that wants it. You know, we don't have to be able to, we're, we, we're not illegals. We're not illegal immigrants in the kingdom of God. If you're in the kingdom of God, you have to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. Okay, our next lesson is the essentials of the kingdom. So, so uh, let's see what, uh, what next week will bring us there.